is the thing we're testing the system itself or our own assumptions and, and knowledge uh, about the system, right? And to some degree, I think we always have to, you know, for any meaningful system of testing, we have to encode somehow knowledge about how, some, somehow and somehow, somewhere knowledge about how, uh, how the system is supposed to behave, right? GM, GM, everyone. My name is Zugash, your host from Scraping Bits. And today I have a special guest, Horsefax, an elite dev in the EVM space. And it's such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to, to talk with you too. Um, so let's start off with basically who you are and, and what you do. Sure. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my pseudonymous dev identity has become Horsefax over the last, uh, the last couple of years. But I'd say I'm primarily uh, an EVM smart contract programmer, uh, and developer uh, working in and around all things all things EVM. Recently, that's been smart contract programming, Solidity. Prior to that, was working on an indexer project, actually, which is sort of how I, I got right. into the space in the first place. You were like Web2 before crypto, or you got into basically Web3 first and did the indexer? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I spent 10 years in Web2 uh, working oh, right. as a... A consultant, actually, so sort of dev shop consultancy, uh, think ThoughtWorks kind of kind of company building building products, usually for uh, for, for companies and, and businesses. Right, right. Um, oftentimes, we do stuff like you know embed with a team in uh, in the, in a company with an existing engineering team, or deliver a product, work work mm-hmm. like that. So yeah, and then sort of made the, the slow transition over into into Web three over the last last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. And how did you get into Web3? The first project I worked on was was an indexer project, a uh, very cool project called Vulcanize DB, which sort of started as as just a project that I got through through my Web Web2 job. Um, this was around, I guess it was early 2018, late 2017 kind of time frame. Okay. So uh, that are. kind of uh, era of the cycle. Yeah. And the original concept for this project was uh, sort of like what became became the graph, if you think of of the graph, okay, right? An right. indexer project. Okay. Uh, we would track uh, track on chain data, you know, monitor a contract for events and state mm-hmm. and storage changes, uh, and expose all you know, ETL that into Postgres and expose that through uh, through a GraphQL API. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I worked on that with with Rick Dudley, uh, right. who is one of the one of the most brilliant people in the space. I think he had this idea for uh, for Vulcanize, which was this this indexer tool. That's since become a larger a larger project. Rick has had a, a long term vision of yeah. of this as a system where where really anyone can run their own indexer and have sort of verifiable uh, access to to verifiable provable uh, state uh, and builds you know build build dApps on top of it. Right. I think everyone. Yeah, yeah. Everyone in the space has probably built their own custom indexer uh, at, at some point, right? But yeah, we got started on, on that project and sort of started. Started as as another project, a very interesting one with a lot of you know interesting technical details that was in this sort of you know this this Ethereum ecosystem, which I had paid some attention to. Was not you know not uh, not deeply involved, but you know I knew I knew what Ethereum was and and yeah. enough to be interested interested in the project and get get started on it. But that really became kind of a full stack introduction to oh, to the EVM and and kind of the full EVM stack, uh, right? So we is this including like nodes as well, or are you talking about exactly. like full stack? In terms of like uh, like websites and like wallets, and... yeah, more more I guess smart contracts and below if we think of the stack that way, right? right so like you know, your application kind of level at the smart contract layer, yeah, down to running nodes and and infrastructure and, and indexing infrastructure, yeah, yeah, and, and so forth. So yeah, at the time we uh, we really wanted access to to state changes, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, historical state changes within within a contract, which was was harder to do then. I think, you know, tracing APIs, there's, there's, it's come a long way, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's then, yeah. uh, we maintained like a fork of geth that would emit over uh, over a WebSocket state diffs on every every blockchain. So you could see, you know, which which storage key changes happened and oh, introspect, introspect that information. Yeah, which was really cool. I think, you know, really ahead of its time in, in some ways. And, and the idea here was that this project, you know, anyone could run a, a, vulcanized, a vulcanized node and, and run yeah, their, yeah. their own indexer. You know, ultimately somewhat more central, centralized services have kind of won out in terms of uh, access to, oh, to no, cache, no. you know, application oh. data, data on Ethereum. Um, mm-hmm. um, uh, but yeah, that, that was my intro. Uh, the claim to fame for that project really was that um, Maker used that for multi-collateral die as their internal internal indexer for for a while oh, so right. okay. uh, we worked with rick on that project worked in combination with the the folks at maker at that and spent a lot of time reading the mcd contracts you know learning about how to decode 
the events and data in those contracts in order to uh, in order to you know convert them and, and index them and store them in a useful way for people to build apps on top of you know in working on that uh, that geth fork got to dig into the internals of of nodes and oh, yeah. uh, that'll be hard and execution a little bit um, got to you know <laughs> be terrified every time there was a hard fork and we needed to rebase oh, our, right, yeah. know, our custom <laughs> patch on top of geth which anyone who's done <laughs> done most stuff I think is familiar with right and yeah spent some time working with you know with the the infrastructural challenges of like just running an indexer and keeping up with uh, with the head of the chain and you know mm-hmm. what do you do when there are, are reorgs and changes to data and you know, yep. what do you do when events are dropped and data is missed, all, all that kind of stuff. I worked on that. You know, it, I was still in sort of uh, engineering management arc at the time <laughs> as well. So worked on and off as kind of an active contributor or just kind of part of, of, of managing that team or, you know, just sort of supporting that team for a while for, mm-hmm. for a few years, but sort of came up for air and realized I had learned learned a lot about the Ethereum, the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, wanted to work, wanted to work on that stuff more, more full time. And so... Yeah, since then the last uh, last two or three years have been much more much more full time focused on on EVM and, and Ethereum. Mm-hmm. And you got into like the tooling space as well um, through this. But I did want to like ask how how did you really like get to understand basically nodes at a deep level? Um, if you were to do all of that again and try and learn it again. Knowing that you know, knowing what you know now, how would you like reapproach that to basically get to an accelerated point? To this point, you are now at like a faster speed, I guess. Uh, it's a good question, and it's tough to untangle for me this interplay between learning the fundamentals of the EVM through sort of practice and, and doing and building things and experiencing mm-hmm. and yeah, I'm the same. learning those principles kind of from the ground up, right? Like I think a lot of things in the design of that system, we, we could have avoided, you know, a lot of <laughs> things we learned or mistakes we made, depending on how you look at them, you know, just by, if we, if we had a, a sort of perfect understanding of, you know, go read the yellow paper from, from scratch and understand how that all, how that all works for me. I can't really solidify that knowledge. Yeah. That theory has to interplay with like, with trying things out in, in yeah, practice, yeah. right. I'm, and, I'm and working same. in practice and, and building. So. Um, Did you ever build like some simple kind of, I guess, tool to interact with it to, to just like trial and error, what, what parts of it do? Or even build like just some simple kind of program to do to emulate what it does, but maybe not copying the code exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think when I go back and think about this project, one I, I don't know if this is <laughs> relevant to your question. One thing I think about a lot is the emergence of Solidity tooling that's that's written in Solidity, right? Like yeah. uh, you know, DS Test and, and Forge and Foundry have been yeah. have been huge in getting yeah, people to write massive. unit tests in in Solidity. And I mean that that was around. That's been around for a long time, right? Daptools was around. DS Test was around. I think mm-hmm. you know Forge and Foundry made this huge improvement in terms of accessibility because <laughs> you know Daptools was you had to install Nix and you know stuff was written in Haskell and, and stuff, yeah. and so it felt felt unapproachable for for folks. But that's been that's been a big step. And when, when I think back to this project as well, we were writing we were writing a lot of our indexer code in in, in Go, which is fine, you know, go mm-hmm. uh, get those in Go and you can you can do stuff on, on, on top of that. But still we were trying to, you know, trying to do these transformations and grab grab data that was, you know, very legible from Solidity from inside inside mm-hmm. the EVM and perform these transformations that were were, you know, somewhat difficult to do in uh in Go from sort of outside the EVM, and I think that that trend is something that's been that's been exciting for me. Right, if I went back into this indexer again, all those transformations would be would be in Solidity, right, rather than rather than Go or, or TypeScript. There was mm-hmm. even a you know, step between there where we rewrote some of that Go to a sort of TypeScript application layer. But mm-hmm. this trend of like let's just write things that interact with the EVM in in Solidity directly, where you have access to to the contract state and yeah, uh, yeah. And whatever manipulations you want to you want to do, and you can can listen to things. I, I think is is a good one. So I, I don't know that, that comes to mind, but I don't know if I don't know to what degree we could have anticipated that right without without building the thing. So I don't know. Yeah, this yeah. is this is a challenge in all <laughs> in all technical work and, and engineering. I think, and part of the challenge is to design systems that are and and a special challenge in in anything, you know, anything Ethereum related that is uh, is often immutable and unchangeable. Right? Is yeah. designing systems that are flexible and open to open to change an extension yeah i think to learn like without over engineering anything like at the node level you basically just got to read like different files and go through like one sec- section of it at a time and kind of like see how you can play around with it then move on to the next or how they intertwine because they all intertwine at some stage 
uh, I guess you have to learn like modularly, right? Um, I yeah, think that's absolutely. Kind of the only way you really can at, at, at a fast pace. Yeah, I think you can work sort of abstraction layer by abstraction layer as well, right? You know, for example, just solidity, uh, right? And I would say when I was starting in smart contracts, right, that's where mm-hmm. that's where I was focused and sort of staying within the boundaries of of just the high level high level language and syntax of, of solidity. You know, that's that's where probably most people start if they're if they're approaching uh, mm-hmm. smart contract or EVM development, right? And then going a level deeper to understanding. Uh, you know, the execution environment of, of the EVM and the VM itself, right? And looking at, at opcodes and writing Huff maybe and sort of dipping dipping yeah, a layer yeah. below that, I did. that level. And then even dipping down to write the execution layer and reading the code in the code in Geth and how that's mapping that, mapping that. You know, there's a ton to learn, I think, from from reading, uh, just reading the source code of an, an execution client. Sort of dipping, for me, I think you, you grow a lot, right? When you kind of dip one level below whatever yeah. whatever abstraction level you're you're working at right yeah i think um, going down to like the bare metal really builds the foundational knowledge of like okay what's actually happening at these higher levels um like i've gone down to half currently and i feel like solidity i, I know exactly you know basically how to optimize everything because you know what's going on under the hood but then i guess even with like opcos if you want to get an even stronger understanding you would go down to like the node level and see what's happening and how everything works. Yeah, I guess that's that's basically the way, I think. And it's kind of what I've done as well. Um, but now you're working on smart contracts and tools as well. Uh, you, you mentioned outside of this, you're, you're working on a fuzz testing engine with Seaport. How, how did you get into that? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was really an amazing opportunity, actually. So Zero Edge and... and- Dan at OpenSea, Seaport team, reached out to me. I think in large part, actually, because I participated in a couple of their uh, their Code Arena oh, audits. They've done, okay, they did the, the big million dollar audit and they did um, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Uh, an audit for Seaport 1.1 or 1.2. Uh, yeah, I had participated in those and you know, I did. I, I don't think we found anything in, in either of them, right? Um, but mm-hmm. uh, did a pretty good you know, Q, QA report in, in those contests. And yeah. I think... Uh, was known to the team for for doing that, uh, mm-hmm. and I just written that article about uh, about invariant testing. Yeah, yeah, uh, at, I saw at that the one time as well. As well. Yep. Yeah, uh, so I've been really into you know exploring invariant testing and foundry fuzzing and some of these sort of more advanced testing techniques lately. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think you know for for folks who are out there participating in C four, uh, you know this is a great example that not just you know it's not just findings that can come out of uh, out of that sort of work, right? But kind of you can establish that reputation, and it was kind of a dream opportunity to go work with uh, with Zero Agent Seaport and, and OpenSea on this. But yeah, they were working on on a fuzzing system for for Seaport. How does that work? Is it just for like uh, inline assembly, or are they going even lower to like Huff? Um, but how, why why are they building like an in house one? Uh, particularly for Seaport. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I don't know if you've have you read the Seaport code base much, or I'm sure, probably, yeah, I've certainly it. you've used OpenSea, right? <laughs> um, um, yeah. Sorry, cut this out. <laughs> can you ask no, no, it's again? good. Like you can take your time. It, it gets cut out. Yeah, yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. So I think Seaport has Seaport is on version one six now, one one five. There have been several iterations yeah, yeah. of uh, of the protocol. Different optimizations and whatnot. Yeah, and like t- testing of Seaport has evolved over time too, right? They have some tests that are in uh, in Forge and Foundry. They have some tests that are, are are in JavaScript, right? There has been you know enough enough evolution of that protocol that there's there's a lot of supporting you know su- supporting code for testing and, and so forth. And you know I. I I'm not sure if you go look by lines of code, but I'm sure the vast majority of that code base is, is support and and test code. Yeah, we were we were interested in there have been a couple of recent recent releases, right? Where like why did they basically develop an in-house fuzzing tool specifically for them when there's you know all these other tools like Echidna, et cetera? This really is sort of a framework that sits on top of the foundry, uh, the, the foundry fuzzer. Okay. Um, and I think, yeah, I think the, the answer to that is I, I describe the system sort of as generative testing, maybe more okay. uh, more than fuzzing, where I sort of think of fuzzing as sort of unbounded, unconstrained fuzzing of call data or input input yeah, space, yeah. right? Um, and this system is sort of starts from starts from a valid order, right? We have a system that constructs a randomized but valid seaport order, and then 
runs it through the engine and makes some some assertions about about what the out- outcome should be there. Like There's Cambridge. also a system that will mutate the order and do uh, do a step that we expect to uh, mm-hmm. expect to revert. But yeah, we sort of start with the start with the assumption that the order is is valid and introspect what are the you know what are the token transfers that should happen here? What are the events we expect? Um, yeah, things like that. Yeah, and like a um, super tailored version. You already know like what sequences can occur. So you basically just fuzz the sequences in different orders, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and we say we say fuzzing a lot, right? But that's like a very broad. Uh, that's a very broad category, right? That I think encompasses on sort of sort of one side of that scale, generative testing, right? Uh, which is maybe a little bit more more constrained to assumptions about your environment, right? And maybe on the far end of that scale, sort of unconstrained call data fuzzing, right? It's something where you just just you know pass random random data into the system and try to try to break invariance or try to break certain. Uh, certain rules, things like yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. And if you think about Seaport, right? Like the Seaport contract is 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 pretty big and has a bunch of subcomponents, right? There's yeah. maybe you've seen like the sort of famous diagram showing all the Seaport Seaport inheritance structure, right? And it has yeah. all these all these internal components. Um, but ultimately it's one it's one contract and it has a pretty reasonably slim external interface, right? I think there are you know eight or, or or ten functions on uh, on Seaport. Most of them are different types of different types of order order fulfillments that take slightly different uh, types and, and constructions of orders, right? And then each of those takes usually a pretty massive struct with you know nested struct representing the the order, and then you know nested consideration items and, and offer items, and a whole a whole series of nested uh, entities that represent the the structure structure of that order. And cer- certainly for me, you know, I've I, I like to fuzz when I'm developing any any project kind of from the ground up if possible. I've been, I've been working on some projects recently that just start with that assumption, right? Let's not even really write specific unit tests. Let's start with making every every test a, a fuzz test and, and go from there. But I think if you've done that right, as your system grows to some scale of complexity, you start to, to need to make a lot of assumptions in, in those fuzzing, right? If you're fuzzing on anything more than, you know, sort of simple simple input arguments, you know, a couple integers and, and an address or, or something. Maybe like uh, dynamic arrays are like a great example of this, right? As soon as you're fuzzing on dynamic arrays, you have to do a lot of set up and a lot of bounding and assumptions and yeah. things within within your tests uh, to, to to make that work. And it becomes you, you write a lot of supporting code that's just just encoding all the assumptions that you're making about about the input and output to your to your tests, right? Mm-hmm. And so sort of starting from this uh, this approach of let's generate a, a valid input and, and go from there. And then maybe mutate it in interesting ways uh, and and tweak certain certain assumptions and verify those, I think yeah. how, that how is an your... approach that can that can work. How did you go around or go about basically mutating them in different ways? Was it completely random or you had like kind of a sequence for that as well? Yeah, there's there's a sequence for that. Um, okay. Yeah, so the sort of whole <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty custom, right? I think it's uh, you know, it's the nice thing about building this all all on top of of the Forge and Foundry fuzzer is that you yeah. can really really customize it to make it bespoke to to the project or use case. So. Yeah, there's a whole there's a whole life cycle mm-hmm. in this in this fuzz engine, starting with with generation, right? Where we have like a whole we have a bunch of enums that represent the the potential state space of a seaport order, mm-hmm. and we sort of randomly walk those enums, pick pick a particular order configuration. Uh, we read that state space enum and then convert that into uh, into a real test order. So, like an example of an enum would be like let's say a buy order then, or what what would an order look like basically? Give me like an example, I guess. Yeah, sure. So uh, an order sort of at, at core usually consists of a list of offer items and a list of, of consideration items. Uh, also, sort of additional uh, contextual information about about who's um, doing the transactions. Doing the transaction, fulfilling the order. Yeah, sort of. Diff- uh, yeah, additional components there. Yeah. Okay. So it's just like randomly sequenced, or like okay, so like there's a there's an enum where like. Okay, there's a buy, there's a sell, and then whatever else, and then basically the sequence is just randomly putting in these in different sequences, right, for X amount of time, like X length, and then it goes reiterates over it in a different sequence, and if it passes, move on to our next one, or if it fails, move on to another branch type thing, or is it completely different? Yeah, so we sort of want to w- work from uh, a randomized state space, which describes this is like a big struct full of enums that describe the configuration of an order. And for Seaport, um, this is stuff like, uh, is it a basic order or an advanced order? Um, 
is the order available now? Is it partially fulfilled? Uh, has it been validated? Not validated? Just its its structure and type, right? Like, is is the offer item a native token, an ERC seven twenty one token, an ERC twenty token? Does it have criteria? Does it not have criteria? Does mm-hmm. it have a fixed amount, an ascending amount, descending amount? Um, all of these different different components that can be sort of the the different parameters that make up a, 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 an open C or, or C port order, and then we walk that state and and go from there, converting those to uh, to what we want to be a valid but randomized uh, randomized C port order. And you can do basically the randomized and basically how do you like form these sequences of random stuff? Sure. So yeah, we'll, we'll we fuzz. Uh, you know, we just use a fuzz seed right as the input, and actually we sort of used we used Solady's libprng pretty extensively to oh, okay. take that fuzz seed and then uh, generate other pseudo random pseudo random components uh, right. Mm-hmm. So we'll take that struct and say, okay, just pick pick out of the the list of possible configurations for uh, for whatever you know this this state space representation is. You know, we pick one of them right. Maybe a good example is like the caller right. We just have mm-hmm. uh, five or six test test addresses and sort of loop, loop through those and, and pick one of those one of those at random. Um, mm-hmm. Or the token types and you know the length of the length of the number of items on 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 the order and so forth. So uh, yeah, then we take that kind of randomized description uh, and then walk over all, all that state and convert it into into a test order. So mm-hmm. you know the same thing you might do in a in you know a unit test or a fuzz test and you know doing your test setup uh, right, but sort of automated through through an engine that that sets that sets that all up. So mm-hmm. so in that sense, it's kind of guided, right? Like we're not fuzzing. Uh, a totally random caller for yeah, yeah. Uh, for every component, right? Or we're not fuzzing like a a totally random token token contract for uh, for everything, right? Yeah. There are places where kind of at the, if you think of like sort of like the leaf uh, the leaf nodes of this state space, oftentimes will fuzz fuzz values or or fuzz something there. But uh, some of the configuration at a higher level, you can think of as kind of like a graph or a tree of the whole. Uh, the whole state configuration of a, a possible order. I think it would be incredibly inefficient if it was just uh, random fuzzing. So I think anything worth having is guided in some some fashion or some way, especially like for time and complexity as well. Like you don't just sit there for five minutes waiting for it to just do you know a whole bunch of iterations. Um, yeah, it's super yeah, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is like a constant trade-off, I think, in, in kind of fuzzing and variant testing and other um, other testing mechanisms that introduce this element of randomness, I think, right? Is this trade-off between, you know, in, in fuzzing, certainly this trade-off between exploration of the space and mm-hmm. quality of the test and uh, these trade-offs you have to think about in terms of introducing assumptions, right, to, to your system that make yeah. the tests more, more meaningful, right, but also make... Uh, introduce assumptions, right? And simplify, simplify the, the extent to which, to which you're testing, right? And so mm-hmm. you have to kind of pick that right balance between fuzzing the entire enormous possibility space and mm-hmm. making assertions that are, that are meaningful, right? If you have a limited number of, limited number of runs, if you're working in this sort of probabilistic, probabilistic sort of, uh, sort of testing model. And I'm curious to how you basically fuzz the call data as well. Like, do you just change like a specific byte or are you changing a whole word for a parameter, uh, I guess. How do you set all that stuff up? Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah, this is actually something that Dylan Keller contributed to extensively. So I can can lay no claim to this, but this is a really cool a really cool system. Uh, we call these scuff tests. Um, okay. <laughs> <Scuff>. <laughs> so to come up with a name for it, yeah, scuffing. So we sort of like scuff the scuff the call data. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and unlike uh, yeah, so unlike the core, the core system sort of takes an, an order. We know it's a valid order, uh, and sort of we're operating at the high, you know, think sort of application level of, of the contract, right? Where mm-hmm. we're working with a, a C port solidity advanced order. We run that through, run that through the C port, fulfill that, and, and verify the expectations about that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, the scuffing engine takes. Uh, it's sort of a separate. It's a separate step within within the engine where there's kind of a whole life cycle defined where you build the order, convert it to uh, convert it to an actual advanced order, uh, run a success case and verify those expectations. Uh, we then perform a, a mutation, right? Where we pick at random some high level mutation to that order uh, and change it in some way and expect a specific revert. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, yeah, when the scuff, when the scuff engine is running, we also have a step where we, we will manipulate the, the call data in some way and expect, uh, expect a revert or, or an error in there. So, mm-hmm. So, um, so it's like you're basically changing whole words, not not like specific pieces of call data, like uh, bytes, really. Um, and how do you determine like the the ranges of which 
to basically fuzz as well. Yeah, we have a whole harness uh, for doing that, that that's built in. Um, I mm-hmm. think we started with some pretty, pretty, that's a system that we're we're actively working on. Um, yeah, it's a different and we're, It's It's really difficult, yeah. And we're working on some some additional mutations there. You'll see, like, it's, I think it's not even in the core, merged to the core C-port repo yet, because we're still sort of actively, actively exploring that. And yeah, that is a yeah. tough, that is a tough problem to pick exactly how to, how to mutate call data and, and do so in a meaningful way. Uh, yeah. Dylan wrote a bunch of a bunch of libraries that, that do that and building on some of the stuff that's already in in Seaport for constructing call data and encoding call data. I don't know if you've seen some of his ability work, a, a, ABI encoding work that's that's used in in Seaport, sort of building on top of that to to manipulate and change uh, change encoding of call data. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but fuzzing call data is extremely hard because you know the ranges on on like the types are just insanely big and it just introduces a lot of time complexity if you're going to go for each basically like i guess increment in let's say a un 256 you you have this gigantic number to to fuzz right and so it's really necessary to do bound analysis just like what a pyrometer does and they mm-hmm. they obviously are a dynamic analysis kind of tool but um yeah it's it's like extremely important to basically bring down your time complexity to as low as possible while being as efficient uh, as basically as accurate as possible. Uh, and it's, it's really difficult. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. It, it, I guess there's like trade-offs to different solutions, but yeah, I guess like what, what's one way, the, the kind of approach you're taking now with your current one? Yeah. In terms of, in terms of managing that possibility space. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, I think it's not just in call data, Buzzing. Well, I, I guess I guess at a high level, right? Everything is called is called data fuzzing, right? But yeah, I mean, if you think about yeah, think about fuzzing an address, right, or a, or a UN two fifty six or something, right? Often that's a really a really enormous space to fuzz. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, in terms of anal- analyzing, I guess in in one specific context, in in Seaport or in just thinking about yeah, the yeah. practice in general, or I think both. Let's do Seaport mm-hmm. then, in uh, general. How we're thinking about like how to find specific yeah, like fuzzing cold data. Like, what? Why would you change something a certain way? Um, or what are the ranges you're going to go by and how do you determine that? Yeah. So we have defined, if I recall how this all works, we have defined what we call scuff directives, which are specific, uh, sort of specific rules that we, that we apply. Okay. So you have like predetermined basically rules for how, how big a, a call data mutation can be or like a word mutation, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder how it would be done in like a generalized sense. Um, so if you're trying to like basically fuzz test just cold order of a protocol, for example, and you didn't write these properties, I guess, what, like specific predefined properties, how would you even basically fuzz cold order in a, in a normal one, in a normal, I guess, protocol? Yeah, I don't know. I think like, I think this is a really interesting thing about testing to me. Like whenever I get deep into testing any system, I get into sort of fundamental questions about knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do we know? <laughs> How do we know what we know? How do we know? You know, it becomes epistemological at some point, right? Mm-hmm. How do we know what we know about the system? How do we know we're testing what we think we're testing? Is the thing we're testing the system itself or our own assumptions and, and knowledge uh, about the system, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to some degree, I think we always have to, you know, for any meaningful system of testing, we have to encode somehow knowledge about how, some, somehow and somehow, somewhere knowledge about how uh, how the system is supposed to behave, right? Mm-hmm. And only, at some point, only a, a human can, can can describe that, right? We can build tools that infer that from from somewhere and in increasingly sophisticated and, and useful ways. Uh, you know, maybe being able to introspect, you know, production code and figure out what assumptions it, it should make and what things we can verify and what things we can test and check. But like somewhere at the core of any system has to be somewhere that we encode that knowledge of what how we think the system is, is supposed to work. So yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I you know, it, I, I always wish there were <laughs> magic tools, right? Where you could just yeah. throw... Uh, just throw something that fuzzes all your all your call data, or throw a magic, you know, formal verification tools feel this way some, some sometimes too, right? You know, uh, run the magic SMT solver that will will tell you where all the bugs are. But I don't think that's how <laughs> I don't think that's how it works. And I think <laughs> once you get down and you think about it, it's all it's all sort of fundamental to to the way that building a system and, and your knowledge of, of those expectations works. So yeah, sorry to get kind of deep and, and philosophical there, but this is always where <laughs> this is always where testing ends up leading me. I have to say. Yeah, yeah, testing is uh, incredibly, well, one, important, but also two, very complex, the lower you go, uh, especially when it comes to automating. Automating is, automating testing is insanely hard. And I, I did not think it would be this difficult when I started, but uh, 
it's it's such a complex problem and it'll keep you busy for i think honestly months or even years uh depending on like which route you go and how you approach it um and if it works or not right you might have to restart and do it all again um but i think a, a testing is like a big part of a uh, reconnaissance on on the protocol or whatever code base you're going off um yeah like you need to know what basically interacts with each other what influences what and then basically get the bounds of what influences and try and twindle it down and into like something reasonable where you're not spending like Mm -hmm. a day waiting. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And then you also got to be accurate as well in those, in those constraints. So it's Mm -hmm. a lot of things, a lot of things to really, uh, to think about when, when automating something like this. Um, But I think if you know the protocol prior, you kind of know what's like common and then what's not common. Um, and kind of like a reasonable bound. And I guess like, let's say you had a, a function with like a UN, I don't know, like a UN 224 and then like a Boolean, then an address. You already know what's kind of a match. Like a Boolean, yeah. you know, like one or, one or zero, but maybe like the UN 24 can be a range of, you know, it's usually going to be, let's say like four bytes, but then it orig- maybe like there's like an outlier that just does like the max or something. So mm-hmm. I guess you can do like some constraints um, for like certain situations, but even just like doing a doing like a, a fuzz where it's like incrementing by one for like a UN two five six, it's kind of like, huh? I don't think that works. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> then you're be there for ages, right? Like, right. Kind of yeah. Why don't we just check all the values? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just like chill here for like a decade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there's got to be yeah, like I mean, some I mean, constraints, right? Or like an efficient way to iterate. Yeah. I think that's that's a place where kind of using using every tool in the toolbox and, and knowing about these these tools that are available is is really useful to me, right? Like mm-hmm. that's a place where maybe a symbolic execution tool or some sort of more some sort of more formal methods based tool would be would be useful in certain scenarios, right? Okay, I'm trying to test some mathematical property and and I can use a tool that gives me gives me a much stronger guarantee than a than a fuzzer if I'm trying to to throw a bunch of you know random random concrete concrete cases at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, or or something like you said, you know, to think about think about the bounds, right? Which uh-huh. um, like Brock is doing with with parameter to to bounds check or or test in that way. You know, I'm I'm a big believer in the interplay even during during development too, like the interplay of your tests and the design of your your code, right? Like uh-huh. I think there are, you know, you'll meet people who are are you know TDD zealots, right, who who really believe deeply in in the influence of of testing on on the design of code. And and I think there's a lot of a lot of truth to to that, right? That uh, your yeah. tests, the things that are hard in your tests, or the things that you're forced to think about in your tests, convey convey meaningful information to you about the design of of, of your code, right? And so, like yeah. bounds are, are a good example there, right? If you're like writing a fuzz test and uh, and it's difficult to to configure those bounds, or or you're finding that you need to need to constrain it in uh, in a bunch of ways, maybe that's telling you something about uh, about mm-hmm. the checks within within your code itself, or uh, or even simply thinking through, right, as, as you're fuzzing something in, in a test and thinking through those inputs to the code, you know, mm-hmm. being forced to kind of slow down and stop and think about where where those boundaries are is something that you can carry over into the into the production code, right? Like if mm-hmm. you if you have a, a you know if, if you're using bound in your your fuzz test somewhere, you should probably be also defining a boundary in your in your code that you can can enforce. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not like just doing an assumption um, of like, okay, this is an open parameter, basically. But we have like yeah. <laughs> we have bounds in our mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess I'm a big believer that like when you feel pain, <laughs> either in your tests or in your code, it's 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 the universe trying to tell you something about <laughs> about the design. <laughs> yeah, testing is such an important thing, but I think it's despised by so many people. It's despised by me, definitely, especially with half. Mm-hmm. When the tooling isn't there mm-hmm. for testing, it's just like the most mm-hmm. horrible experience. But yeah, like yeah, we need a. We need a uh, test framework for Huff that gives you direct stack access for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I think like Foundry Debug is pretty good, but it is like somewhat tedious and takes a while to like set up. But it at least it's a tool, right? Like without that, oh my god, <laughs> Jesus, testing would not be fun in Huff. But yeah, I think tool devs are like extremely are in like a massive shortage, right? It's so hard to find like a good tool dev or someone that's even interested in it, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, like, how did you even get into basically tool dev? You you you, you were on Seaport's C4 contest, got poached, and then held into <laughs> automated fuzzing. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would we call it tool dev? It's, 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 it's a really interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting system, right? Because it is, it's a bunch of Solidity code, right? That sits on top of on top of the Foundry fuzzer. Um, but you know, it, it's not like we're writing Rust to, to to do it. It's it's all Solidity, right? It's all it's all libraries and, and code that's built on top of you know on top of the base test class within within Foundry. So yeah, I mean, it's a tool, right? <laughs> it's definitely a tool, right? It's bespoke bespoke code. It's all written in Solidity, and, and it's a tool. But uh, yeah, I don't know if I'd describe that as a tool dev in the same way that like say the core. The core folks who are building up at Foundry every day are are really working on on improving those tools. So uh, mm-hmm. much respect, much respect to them. I think this I think this this design is pretty cool, right? And more teams could be could be could be building sort of bespoke uh, bespoke systems on top of on top of the tools that Foundry has, has given us, right? And the, the abstractions uh, that that Foundry provides, you can you can build a lot on top of that. And it's been fun for me in uh, you know in the Seaport case too to do do stuff like this that is sort of. Uh, what you know, wildly, wildly inefficient that I would never do, never do in a production contract, right? Uh, like a, a lot of the core of this Seaport code is a library called Seaport Soul, which was James Emo worked on and built out, which is a bunch of a bunch of libraries for interacting with Seaport structs and in, in, in Seaport code, and sort of like builder libraries for building up all the different structs and components and and data types and entities that you need to to interact with Seaport. And yeah, building this huge you know fuzz engine engine contract on on top of uh, on top of the base test case and, and building all that out. Um, it's kind of fun to have this playground that you can do interesting and experimental and kind of advanced solidity stuff in without necessarily uh, deploying it to, yeah. to production or thinking about all those things that you have to think about when you're really trying to, to gas optimize a, a, a contract or uh, deploy something that's going to be out there in on chain. Like building a fuzzing engine in itself is extremely like challenging tasks, but it's also incredibly fun as well. And I think going down that route also brings a lot of a lot of like new pathways and opportunities that you wouldn't like think would come, even though it's like a very niche thing in itself. Like that's what I've noticed when like getting into it as well. And I never had the intentions of getting into it either. It just kind of like happened when I was like writing half. I'm like, huh, why can't I just like automate this <laughs> to mm-hmm. test for me? But yeah, it's it's quite interesting and. Like, yeah, how did, how did you really get pulled into it? Like, did they just teach you from scratch or were they just like, yo, try this? In, in terms of testing in general? Um, more like the fuzzing and like automated analysis, I guess. And fuzzing. Yeah, I've been, you know, I've been playing with fuzzing in, I've been playing with fuzzing and generative testing for, for a long time. Uh, in my oh, okay. pre, you know, in my pre-solidity career, I, I was very interested in, in testing, in, in generative testing, um, stuff like quick check. And uh, I was really okay. into the closure ecosystem for a time and generative testing in, in closure had a cool, there's a cool eco- ecosystem for that type of testing in, 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 in closure and seeing it in, uh, seeing it in depth tools and seeing it in, in the EVM, uh, yeah was sort of a continuation of, uh, continuation of that. You know, I, I have to say, I never used it that it was, it was interesting to me. And, you know, the theory behind it was interesting. And like the design of, of quick check and tools like that was, was really cool in the, the web two space, but I never really used it too extensively in my, in my prior career. But then coming into EVM, these, these tools are, are, uh, I, I think especially, especially useful and especially well suited in this super immutable, super adversarial environment where you, you have to use every every testing tool at your disposal to to really test the hell out of everything you're yeah. building, and so seeing it there, you know, sort of brought over some of that some of that interest and some of that understanding from 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 previous work. So yeah, I guess it's something I've always been always been interested, interested in. Yeah, it's, it's it's quite a fun area. Um, so is this how you're spending most of your day right now? Uh, just doing this, or are you also doing some other stuff on the side? Uh, yeah, I'm working on a few things. I've been uh, been working independently since uh, since February of this year, just working across a few different projects and teams and, and things that are interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the C part fuzzing work is uh, has mostly been wrapped up, but a couple of the things I've been working on are working with um, the Farcaster team right now. They're migrating the Farcaster protocol uh, to to mainnet to have permissionless open onboarding for users of Farcaster. So I've been Mm-hmm. Uh, helping them out with with that a bit and getting their contracts ready there. Mm-hmm. Um, I've mm-hmm. been working a little bit with the folks at uh, at Party Bid as well, Party DAO. Oh, uh, yeah, we just launched Party, <laughs> latest Party app. Yeah, so um, just you know, different different projects and, and folks who I've connected with uh, in in the ecosystem. Right, right. And, and how do you really like approach get approach for like uh, these con- this contract work, or do you kind of approach them? Yeah, I think uh, I think working in public has been most useful, useful for me. Um, mm. you know, just C4 has been a great place to do that, right. To establish, uh, establish a security focused yeah, reputation yeah. and participating in, in projects there. Uh, they just launched these new, uh, new profile pages, which I think are really, really, really cool. Oh, yeah, so great place to showcase here. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. 
Um, yeah, it's quite good because uh, it's kind of like a promo on your name. It, it's like, okay, here's like actual experience and what you rank against the rest. And then people come and basically poach the top people. I think it's like a terrific platform to basically get your name out there and show what you can do. Yeah, I think it's an amazing, it's an amazing ecosystem. And the, the ecosystem has been evolving <laughs> rapidly, right? Like the past, the past year, there's been uh, both, you know, both demand, both demand side and, and supply side, right? Of the number of, of auditors and, and researchers out there and the number of protocols and, and amount of code, code that's out there. Mm-hmm. I think like, you know, it's interesting to observe how, how the sort of two, two sides of that supply demand curve, you know, interact and change and, uh, and evolve over time. But like the amount of, of smart contract code that is, <laughs> is being developed is just simply going to outpace the, the number of eyeballs that, that we have for, oh, yeah, in, for sure. in, in the long term, for sure. I think, uh, and, I think like long term, it's just going to be, some automated tools basically do auditing, but it, I yeah. think it's also like a very difficult task um, in in terms of like business logic, right? Because how how do you get like an understanding of what the contract is meant to be doing? But I guess in terms of um, like post deployment, then you already know what it's not meant to be doing, which is like losing money. <laughs> so it's quite easy to like think of ways to do that. But I think. Pre-deployment, it's a uh, it's a whole different game, right? I wonder if you ever gone into like AI kind of like uh, fuzzing as well. Have you ever like thought of that, or would that not be on your radar at all? I, I think there are interesting places to to explore there for sure. I think with any uh, I think with any automated tool, right? It's it's most useful when it's augmenting human human intelligence, right? I haven't, I I, I think we'll get there, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But certainly, certainly I found those tools really useful in augmenting my own, uh, right. My own work writing rank. I I was really skeptical at first, I I have to say, right. You know, solidity in particular feels so, so security critical, right. That thinking like, Oh, I'll let, I'll let copilot autocomplete for me. Uh, (laughs) seemed dangerous, right. For a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Feeding something to, to check GPT. Right. But yeah. And maybe, you know, maybe I'm kind of a boomer. Right. But, but I've been, yeah, I've been uh, increasingly, increasingly impressed with, with, with these tools and increasingly using them in my own workflows, right. To augment, augment what I'm doing and, yeah. uh, and feeling like they do, they do a good job. Right. Yeah. I think it's a, like a terrific kind of thing to implement into your workflow as well. Like, for example, if you made like uh, a program to find all the control flows in, in basically a, a smart contract prior to auditing, then you've just eliminated yeah. like X amount of time of basically just reading. And now you can just focus on what you do best, which is finding bugs. Um, you don't have to just spend, you know, I don't know how many hours it would normally take so on, but, you know, a couple of hours just to understand the contract. Then you start working on what you're actually good at, right? <laughs> so yeah, I think it's kind of like a superpower, really having a, the ability to make a tool to help you in what you want. Um, yeah, and if you can do it effectively, absolutely. then it's just like, oh, wow, <laughs> I've just made my life, you know, X amount better <laughs> or more right. efficient. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested about the bot races on, uh, on C4. What do, you, what do you think of those? Yeah, I haven't participated at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's, I think the concept, the concept is interesting. How have they been performing? I actually haven't, I haven't kept up with it with the meta on, on bot races. I know, uh, I think they're quite basic. What have you observed now? in terms of, yeah. But like, yeah, I think they're quite basic at the moment where they're only finding, you know, lows, mediums. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think any of them have the capabilities of finding criticals of like, at like, you know, quite complex criticals, not just, you know, uh, valid, um, like data validation, like input, I mean, or like re-entrancy or anything like that. Like those are pretty mm-hmm. easy to find, but like the unique, you know, need to think of outside context. I don't think anybody's even like remotely close to finishing that. Um, mm-hmm. Apart from maybe one person, I, I talked to him prior on the podcast, uh, Lucas from Pen Testify. He's doing like okay. a similar thing to me where, uh, actually he's doing kind of like the exact same thing, but with AI, which is basically like, like just building a program to only find criticals. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's what I'm doing and that's what he's doing as well, but he's doing with AI. So, but I don't think any of the bots currently have even like close to cracking that. I think it's all in like a, I think it's the language like re, reject, rejects or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. how to say that word, but uh, yeah, I think so they're pretty, all of that yeah. apparently. So I think it is I interesting. Um, it could definitely like find a lot of hope, low, low hanging fruit. And I think that's going to like stop all of those basically from, it's going to like prevent a lot of normal like 
human auditors from finding low low hanging fruit because it's just so easy to mm-hmm. get automatically. So I think it's it's also like a good shift for like forcing auditors to become better at identifying more critical things. Yeah. They, they, otherwise, they won't be have, they won't have a job then. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So I think it, I think it is quite yeah, I, cool. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's very interesting to to go back and look at kind of previous previous findings and previous previous reports and the evolution of. Uh, where that bar has been has been over time, and, and just how rapidly th- that has evolved and changed, even on even on C four over the past nine months, right? Mm-hmm. I think it would be like a fun little task oh. just to fuck, just to build like a little a little bot to find low hanging fruit. I think I mean you can even sure. do that with just like ChatGPT. Actually, I think that's probably what someone would do. I, I think the really interesting thing about C4 is kind of, uh, you know, embedding those incentives into the system, right? I think of it as an iterated evolutionary game, right? That hopefully the outcome, the outcome of that game is, uh, is positive sum for everyone, right? More secure protocols and in a healthy community of, of, of people who are auditing and, mm-hmm. and auditors who are participating, you know, being, being well compensated for, for that work. But yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, simply setting up the, the incentives, right? And the bot race, so something like a, like a bot race tool, uh, you know, starts pretty simple, but if the incentives are, are aligned over time, you can really, uh, really evolve that over time. And so hopefully this is sort of the foothold for, uh, for that to evolve into something, uh, something mm-hmm. that could be, could be really useful. And we'll, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think you should definitely try. You, you've gone into basically fuzzing, right? So. Why not build something that's kind of like generalized in a way? Yeah, I've got to got to get back in the game. I've been <laughs> I haven't been on C4 in a, in a few months now. But yeah, you were asking about building in public. That's that's one place. I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think another thing is just just building building little projects and putting them out there in, in, into the world. And I've, I've done a lot of you know when I was sort of getting my sea legs in in uh, in the ecosystem, I did a lot of global hackathons and mm-hmm. you know side projects and, and, oh, right. and things like that. And yeah. That's been that's been a really great uh, path into into the ecosystem for for me. I've been yeah yeah definitely. Uh, you meet a lot of people for these uh, these events as well, don't you? I think I went to one. It was uh, Eve Tokyo, and that was like my first ever event. Just for anything, actually, <laughs> um, it was quite yeah. fun. You meet a lot of people, and especially if you already have like a presence online, you start to actually put a face to, to like a name. Um, depending on what you do, you may not want to do that, but it is a great networking opportunity, right? Yeah, it's a great networking opportunity. For me, I really like to approach those, you know, as this challenge of can you build build something end to end in in forty eight hours? Or oh yeah, yeah, I love those. <laughs> I mean, I do it already. Contest, at home. Right? It's kind of like you yeah. put, a, put a little timer on in your head, like all right, let's see if I can do this in a day. But then you start yeah. a little hackathon in, in your own kind of yeah. space. Um, yeah, and without you know, without sacrificing quality and 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 really challenge yourself to that, you know, it's kind of like a like a time trial or uh, yeah, or, yeah, or exactly. Something like that. Yeah, how did you get into like auditing as well? By the way, I just started with started with C four. <laughs> You're like, oh, I already developed. May as well just look at the code code base and see how I, it goes. Yeah, you know, I was working on I was working on my first my first code that was gonna gonna go to production and and be deployed. I you know I, I hesitated to write smart contracts for a very long time. I attribute some of that I think to so working originally with uh, the maker team who have a, mm-hmm. a very high engineering bar and engineering standard. And I, I still mm-hmm. think, you know, those maker contracts are some of the best, some of the best EVM code ever written. And so to me, it was very, very intimidating to, to deploy anything to mainnet, right? If you, you go back and look at my, at my oh, history, yeah, uh, I have lots of, well. lots of projects that were just, you know, on testnet or never deployed or put yeah, it on, yeah. on Polygon or something. I think, you know, the, the boom in NFTs really, really helped me, right? Because suddenly not everything was was DeFi, right? You know, handling uh, millions of dollars of, of ERC-20 tokens or, or whatever. You know, there was this little corner of the ecosystem that was uh, that was was kind of fun. And there are a lot of interesting things you can do and build with NFTs. And they're, you know, sort of more creative and artistic in, in, in some ways. And so a little bit less pressure to to build something that is, you know, mm-hmm. NASA NASA space shuttle quality <laughs> quality code, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And so... You know, and and yeah, I remember uh, you know on chain SVGs and, and things like that are just just fun to work with. So a lot of my early projects were kind of uh, little little things like that. Yeah, um, building like little little projects is a great way to boost your reputa- reputation. Um, just keep them like basically shipping, and eventually someone's going to notice it, right? And then try and yeah, try and onboard you or contract you or even just connect with you, right? And then it's yeah, a, it's a great way to like share. People want to see value, and then once you can provide value, they'll they'll provide value to you as well. I think that helped me. Yeah, I, I did it in a way yeah. where I just did like content, like uh, articles, and now podcasts. 
So that's kind of providing yeah. value. But like these little projects are also like a terrific way. I did like a Mev template and that blew up surprisingly. And it's the same with anything, like just keep shipping and then people eventually start noticing, right? Because it's a uh, out in yeah. the open. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so my yeah my path into security was really focused because because I was developing as well, and I just wanted to test my own right test test my own my own abilities there a little bit right like calibrate mm-hmm. myself can I can I see the bugs in my own, in my own code do I have mm-hmm. the, the capacity to 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 see it am I am I self aware enough to to know mm-hmm. and yeah fortunately I did did pretty well in in auditing and was able to to calibrate myself there there a bit. Um, but honestly, I consider myself sort of a, a midwit auditor. <laughs> I'm, I don't know, I'm number 100 or something, I'm a little under 100 of all time on on the C4 leaderboard. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's very much a power law distribution, right? The top, the top 10 or 20 people in there are are, oh, yeah. are, are really brilliant, and the best auditors are, are absolutely built different than the than the best devs. I think they're doing you know symbolic execution of the code in their in their brain or something, <laughs> something like that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, I think every you know every dev should should try their hand hand at it. Every every auditor should try their hand at, at development, right? It's all it's all, all all connected for me, and I prefer to prefer to to, to do both, right? But yeah, yeah. but that's how it originated for me. Yeah, and uh, I, I think I still consider myself more in that way, right? Like I uh, mm-hmm. I am a dev who dev with a focus on security more so than a security researcher who does development. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to establish that connection as well, because especially for developers, you you need to know what kind of attack vectors there are so you can build secure code and you can't really do that I, I mean that's what happened to me like when I first started I didn't do security at all um, I didn't like personally get hacked but it was something that was always dwindling in the back of my mind like huh how do I know that this is secure <laughs> well like yeah. you can build tests sure but like it, you only cover so much um, you're, you're not going to think about like okay it's already deployed it's established it's initialized okay what protocols can I use to hack this or what kind of like abnormalities can occur at like, I know a certain block block. Yeah. A certain blocks block timestamp or with X amount of tokens from this account. Yeah. It's, it gets just like too complex, I think. Um, but even just having like the information of, okay, what are common vulnerabilities? I guess like re suit, data validation. Okay. Cover those. But like maybe the the newbie dev doesn't know about those, so they can't really uh, think about it too often. Um, you need to have like experience, at least a little bit of experience in cybersecurity, I think, for uh, being an efficient developer. And the same same goes with uh, auditors, I think. Yeah, yeah, man. I th- I think it's it's been quite good. We are running to an end now, but hopefully you've enjoyed this, and I hope the audience has enjoyed listening as well. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you on, and yeah, it's been great. Thanks, yeah, this was a great conversation. (laughs) Of course. All right, everybody, take care. (laughs) All right, thanks, man.